Okay, this is a lecture for my seventh class on the 14th. Well, sorry, the third, the, this is the 13th of uh, April. Okay, so uh, World War I kills progressivism. You know, you know, 1900 to 1920, you've got three progressive presidents. You've got TR, and by that I mean this is, this is a liberal, okay, liberal progressives. So you've got the TR, you've got Taft, and you've got Woodrow Wilson. Uh, but then comes World War I, and the progressive era is over. So then from 1921 until 1933, it's a you have uh, the Republican ascendancy. There are three Republicans in a row. And, uh, you know, uh, they are conservatives to a different degree, harding conservative. The real conservative is the guy in the middle here, Calvin Coolidge. And get this down, Calvin, Calvin Coolidge is going to be president of the United States for most of the 1920s. And then you got Herbert Hoover, and Herbert Hoover's sort of a progressive, but he's conservative. So this is a this is a Republican, this is a Republican uh, ascendancy, okay? Let me get to the right place here. Um, so uh, under uh, Harding, uh, there are a lot of scandals. Uh, of course, you know, they were able to keep that covered up as long as Harding was alive. But when Harding dies, uh, and there's great national mourning, and oh, his train goes across the United States, and thousands turn out weeping to see him because he was really a very popular president. But uh, about six months after his death, uh, they could no longer ignore the rumors of things that had been going on in the Harding administration. And so the Congress starts an investigation. And, they, and, and I'm not going to talk about all the things they uncovered, but they uncovered, uh, you know, quite a few, uh, quite a few scandals. Uh, and one, you know, I mean, you've got, you've got the, the director of the Veterans Administration. He's stealing money. Uh, you have the attorney general. He's selling booze to organize crime. That would be as if there was someone in the administration today uh, selling uh, or, 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 you know, you know, selling drugs to, to confiscated drugs, drugs that the government had confiscated and turning right around and selling them to Mexican fentanyl dealers coming across the border. Uh, that would cause quite a scandal. And then there was the teapot dome scandal. Did we do the teapot dome scandal or did we just mention it? Okay. Well, the teapot dome, teapot dome was an oil field. The most simple way I can tell you this teapot dome was an oil field in Wyoming and the government had bought it. You know, the government owns all sorts of oil fields, uh, and they had set this one aside as a naval oil reserve. It, that, that oil couldn't be drilled by a private company. If we went to war, uh, they could drill it, but it would go directly to the Navy. This belongs to the United States Navy. Uh, also, there was a naval oil reserve in Elk Hills, Nevada, okay? And uh, this, there are three members of Harding's cabinet that are going to get involved in this scandal. But what they did, just to put it in a nutshell before I talk about them individually, what they did is that they sold this, they, they, they allowed, get this down, they allowed private oil companies to go in and drill oil in this Navy, in this, this oil field set aside for the Navy. I mean, that's putting national security at risk. You might even call that treason. I don't think it is, but you might even call it treason. You know, do they still have the station downtown with the green dinosaur there? Do they still have that? Sinclair. And you follow it? Sinclair? Yeah. Well, it's named after the guy who bribed three officials in Harding's administration to let him drill oil there. His name was Harry Sinclair, Sinclair Oil Company. I guess there's still a Sinclair Oil Company. He bribed them, and they let him take his oil rigs in there and drill, and he made a lot of money. They pay, And, of course, when he made money, when he made millions on this illegal drilling, he paid them a kickback. He gave them some money. That's what a kickback is. He paid them a kickback. In fact, of $500,000, which with today's money would be several, several million, million dollars. And of course, the man in charge of this oil field was a man named uh, Albert B. Fall. And you don't have to write him down, but he was the secretary of the interior. I mean, just, uh, you know, don't get tied up in all these names and everything. Just here's a member of the United, here's the secretary of the interior. And he is allowing private oil companies to uh, drill oil in fields set aside for the United States military because they're paying him a uh, million dollars to do it. And he got the million dollars, but he got caught. Uh, Albert B. Fall did. He got caught and he got sent to prison. Uh, he was the first cabinet member, I think, ever to go to prison. 
We've talked about Charles Forbes. Charles Forbes was the director of the Veterans Administration. He's embezzling half the money that he was given. You know what embezzle means? Embezzle, you know what that means? Yes or no? I give you $300 to run the concession stand and you put 200 of it in your pot. Embezzle is just a fancy word for stealing. He's stealing government money. He's not building hospitals. He's not uh, staffing and stocking those hospitals with all the things you need to run a hospital. He's selling those things, those VA supplies, and putting it in his pocket. And then there was the Attorney General, Harry Dardery. We've talked about him, like I say, in the era of prohibition. Drinking was against the law. He's supplying the president booze at the White House. And even though liquor was illegal, he sold government-manufactured liquor <clears throat> to uh, organized crime figures. Okay. Uh, even though booze was illegal, the government did manufacture some alcohol. Um, they gave it to doctors. Uh, passed it. You know, doctors could apply for it. Uh, pharmacies could apply for it for medicinal purposes. That's you know, medicine was not nearly as advanced a hundred years ago as it is today. If you got pneumonia, they gave you wine. You went to bed, and they put you under blankets, and they gave you wine, and everybody just hoped that you pull through. A lot of people didn't, and some people did. Uh, well, so the government, you know, they know they can't keep doctors and pharmacies from having this booze, even though nationally booze is illegal. So the government had distilleries where they made booze, but they just parceled that, they parceled that out to people. Uh, and uh, Dartery uh, simply, he made, I think he sold 60,000 gallons to organized crime. He sold it to people like Al Capone so they could sell it and make a fortune out of it. Again, you have a member of the president's cabinet and he's selling booze to organized crime. Okay. Selling drugs to organized crime. Uh, so all those things are discovered. And of course, you know, Harding who had been very popular and very beloved. And when he had died, there'd been national mourning. His reputation just fell like a rock and it's never recovered. Well, when they rank presidents, he's always, he's always one of the worst, but the greatest shock about Harding <laughs> to the American people that uh, came, um, you know, because they pretty much believed that Harding was a great president. The biggest shock in all this came when it was discovered that Harding had kept a mistress while he was in the White House. It wasn't his first mistress, but uh, it was a young lady named Nan Britton. Um, and I wouldn't worry about noting Nan Britton, just he kept the mistress in the White House. And when he died, she wrote a book, a tell-all book. Okay. Harding was dead and he couldn't defend himself. So you've got to take what she wrote with a grain of salt. But she wrote in this book, by the way, she called it the president's daughter. And she did have a daughter by Harding. Okay. So the proof was, you know, the, yeah, but she, she did have a daughter by Harding. And she writes this book after he's dead. You know, he can't contest, he can't defend anything. You know, it's all, you know, he can, it's, it's, it's really easy to criticize the dead because they can't talk back. She wrote a book called The President's Daughter. And according to her, uh, when she went to Harding and said, I'm pregnant, uh, he advised her to get an abortion. Uh, but she didn't. She had his child, uh, a little girl named uh, Elizabeth Ann Britton. You know, this book, like I say, was a tell-all. It was a scandal sheet. Um, you know, it was gossip. You know, there's nothing, you know, the American people just, uh, there's nothing we like better than that. Uh, it told how that when Harding was in his 40s, he, they had met. She was only 16 uh, they had this sexual relationship. Well, right there, uh, you can list the first thing. That's statutory rape. Uh, she told how that, you know, he would sneak away from his wife. He's a U.S. senator. He would sneak away from his wife, and they would go down to the, uh, you know, the poorest section of town, and they would meet in these shabby hotels. She even claimed that they had sex on Harding's desk in his o Senate office, and she claimed that there was where the little daughter was conceived. Again, this is her word. She also told the story that on one occasion the in the White he sneaked her into the White House and the butler opened up the closet to get a and there was, the, you know, to put it kindly, the president uh, and his mistress Nan Britton in a state of un unclothedness. I'll just put it that way. Uh, so all those stories come out. Harding's dead. He can't answer back, can't defend himself, but it just wrecked his reputation. And in short, it is true 
that the what the Amer you know not, not all these things are true, but uh, you know collectively there were a lot of them that were true, and this just wrecks the Harding administration. Harding was weak. He was a nice guy, you know. Uh, if he was going to uh, Shakota today to Walmart when he pulled, and there was some poor unfortunate soul standing on the side of the road with a sign taking Harding would always pull over and give them money. In the morning in Marion, Ohio, when he walked down to his office, all the poor guys there, you know, that maybe were unemployed, they just lined up because they knew the time he was coming and he would drop something in everybody's hand. He was a nice guy. Everybody called him good old Warren. Everybody liked him, but he was weak. He let his friends who were crooks run the government. Uh, and you see the end result of that. And again, uh, within a year, you know, here the nation was still in mourning over his death, but within a year of his death, his popularity, like I say, sunk like a rock. And of course, the American people, what's the result of all this? You know, this isn't just a scandal sheet. The American people felt betrayed. They felt betrayed and get this down. So by the early part of the 20s, uh, the confidence of the American people in their government is sinking. And when people lose faith, you know, people talk about why do great nations fall? I, I teach a course, or I used to teach a course that I really enjoyed called Western Civilization, and we did the Roman Empire. Of course, the big, there are two big questions. Roman history is 1,200, 1200 years of history. There are two big questions about Roman history. How did Rome come into existence, and how did it go out of existence? And we've never quite decided the answer to either one of those. There's a raging debate going on about those two questions. But my theory of why Rome fell is because the people of Rome decided the government up there in Rome isn't working for me. And they lost faith in their government and they no longer participated in their government. When people lose faith in their government, eventually, and I'm not talking about a long eventually, eventually their government will go away. Uh, and so the American people at the beginning of the twenties, uh, their, their approval of the government, their participate, you know, voting levels are low because people say, what difference does it make? There's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. They're all the same. They all make a bunch of promises and they never, and then all they do is go up there and argue and they never, they never get around to fulfilling their promises. If that sounds like today, it's exactly like today. Uh, and that was the end result of Harding. People have so much faith in him. You know, we're going to turn a page from this awful world war one. Here's Warren Harding. He looks presidential. And of course he failed. Uh, and so the people's faith in government fell to an all time low. Well, enter into the picture at this point, with all these things going wrong, enter into the picture, an unlikely savior of the nation, okay? This man right here in the middle, one of my favorite presidents, and say he was a great president, I just think he's funny, uh, Calvin Coolidge, okay? Famous redhead, Calvin Coolidge. He was actually born on the 4th of July in 1872. He's a farmer, okay? He comes from a farm in Vermont. He's an all-American boy. He was just the opposite of Harding. Get this down. And boy, he's a, listen, of the three, he's the most conservative. He is a conservative's conservative. Hard, he was just the opposite of Harding. Harding had always been a backslapper. You know, he'd slap you on the back, lean over and tell you the latest dirty joke he had heard. And he was always, looking while he's doing that, he's looking over your shoulder at his next sexual conquest out there. This guy was completely different. He was a redheaded Vermont lawyer, country lawyer. Uh, people said he had a hatchet face. They said his face looked like it was carved in stone. Uh, he rarely smiled. He looked like that, just like that all the time. Let's see. Oh, there's there's Nan Britton and there's Mrs. Harding. Okay, there are the two. Okay, there's she wrote the president's daughter. Coolidge looked like that. After he becomes president, they send a guy to the White House to spend the whole day with him, and he just goes around taking pictures of Coolidge. And it was Life Magazine or Look Magazine, one of those. And they ran a whole page of little pictures that this, and it was, and every picture looked just like that. He never caught him smiling. He never caught him with another uh, uh, look on his face. In fact, one newspaper said he looked like he had been weaned on a dill pickle. Okay, he had a sour disposition. He was quiet. He was reserved. He didn't talk a lot. Harding never shut up. He could sit in his room, or he could sit in a room, maybe his room, but he could sit in his room, and he enjoyed doing this. He would just go sit in the room by himself. 
and smoke cigars for two hours at a time and not say a word. Okay, he enjoyed that. He said some pretty wise things, I think. The American people just love this guy because he had the, you know, when he did talk, pretty wise stuff. He said, and I, I quote, four fifths of our troubles would just disappear if we would just sit down and be quiet. End quote. He said, that'd take care of four fifths of our problems. I thought he was pretty good. He also said this, and everybody ought to remember this. I ought to have it tattooed on my forehead because I find it hard to keep my mouth shut. But I ought to have it tattooed on my forehead. And I've got a room up there. I can put a paragraph about it. And just every morning when I shave, look in the mirror and see that. But he said this. Let's think of what he's going to say. Here's a politician. This would be good for great for politicians today. He said, I can't be because somebody said to him, Governor Coolidge, this one is or President Coolidge, you never say anything. It's driving us nuts. We're the press. And Coolidge just looked at him and said, I can't be held accountable for what I didn't say. I can't be held accountable. That's pretty smart. I can't be held accountable for what I didn't say. At a White House dinner, this is one of my favorite Coolidge stories. It was a White House dinner, and the press was there to cover it. And the press had to sit way back in the corner because there were other dignitaries. But there was a young woman who was a newspaper reporter. And boy, that was a huge thing in 1920, a woman reporting the news. And so Coolidge had invited her to sit up at the head table with him. And she was back there kind of holding that over all these male reporters. She was saying, yeah, you're going to be stuck back here in the corner. And I'm going to be right at the elbow of the president. Boy, I'll get a great story. And one of those reporters said, what do you mean? He won't say anything. And you can sit up there. And she said, oh, yeah. She said, I'll get him to talk. And, and, and so one of the reporters said, I'll bet you 10 bucks that, you know, and this is a banquet. She's going to be up there at least an hour. I'll bet you 10 bucks you can't get two words out of it. Two words. And she said, I'll take that. And all those other reporters said, yeah, I'll bet you 10 bucks too. I want some of that. I'll bet you 10 bucks. So she goes up and she sits by Coolidge. And he's sitting there just staring straight ahead. Just like that. And she kind of scrunches up beside her, beside him. And she sort of bats her baby blue eyes. And finally she says, uh, Mr. President, turns and looks at her. She said, you see those reporters back there? He looks. She said, they bet me $10 each that I could not get more than two words out of you all evening. And Coolidge looked at her and said, you lose. And didn't say anything else. He said exactly two words. You lose. And not another word. And she lost, she lost the bet. He married his wife, Grace, at the time, I think, you know, I think the most beautiful first lady would be a contest between Jacqueline Kennedy and, and Michelle Obama. Uh, uh, Coolidge's wife, Grace Coolidge, though, I think was the prettiest uh, first lady up until Coolidge's time, and maybe for several years after. Uh, he first saw her, he was, or she first saw him, she was crossing a street and he was a young lawyer and he was standing in a window shaving and he had his hat on and she just thought that was odd to shave with your hat on. And so they met each other, you know, started dating and here was his proposal to her. Like I say, he didn't say very much. Here's how he proposed to her. He said to her, I'm going to marry you. And he turned around and walked away and he married her and they lived happily as ever after. Okay. He was as silent as a cake of ice. He slept more than any other president, by the way. He got up late in the mornings. By the way, he didn't even have a telephone on his desk. <clears throat> and he would get up, and about 8 o'clock, he and the first lady would have breakfast, and by 9, he would, walk over, he would walk over to the Oval Office, and he would have a couple of appointments, and then he would be back by 11 to have lunch, and then he would have a couple of appointments, and at about 3 o'clock, about 3 o'clock, he would uh, go behind his, well, he would lower all the, sh the, the blinds in the Oval Office. He would go behind his desk and he would pull out his desk drawer and lean back in his chair and prop his feet in that desk drawer and he'd take a nap, okay? He'd sleep every day. And he did that and then he would get up and he'd work a couple more hours and he would go have dinner with the First Lady at about 6 o'clock and then at about 8 o'clock he was back in bed and he would sleep until 7 or so, 6.30 or 7 o'clock uh, the next morning. Um, for exercise, he rode a horse. Well, it's not exactly true. He didn't exactly ride a horse. He was allergic to horses. 
So uh, there's Grace Coolidge. There's his wife. Uh, he, uh, there she is. The Coolidge's loved animals. He had six dogs in the White House. That's their pet. Look how big that raccoon is. That's their pet <laughs> raccoon. That's their that like a little bear. Like yeah, that. yeah, that's that's Rebecca. And you notice, you know, and, and you know, every year, I, I guess the, the vibes are about to happen. Every year, it started with Grover Cleveland. The president has an Easter egg hunt for children on the White House lawn, and he just invites all these children, and they come. Well, there it is, and you can kind of see how children dressed in the twenties. But there she is. And she's holding Rebecca, and you notice Rebecca's got a chain on her because I guess, you know, uh, Rebecca was an ornery little cuss, you know, and it just had to run to the White House. And people would be in the Oval Office talking to the president. You know how raccoons are. You ever been around a raccoon? Well, anything shiny they see, like the back of my head. Uh, I'm not kidding you. They will swat at it. Uh, and they just crawl. They never stop moving. They just walk. If we had a raccoon in here, it would be crawling over everything, knocking things over. And if, if it came to the back of your head, it'd just crawl right up the back of your neck and go right over your head. And it did that occasionally. Well, you know, I mean, I guess she has to, Rebecca. Rebecca's kind of on that kid right there. Like, you know, she would like to attack and kill him. So they've got mm -hmm. him on a chain there. Got her on a chain there. They had six dogs. There were birds flying all over the White House. They had four cats. Um, they loved animals. But anyway, he was allergic to horses. Back to my story. Uh, there, well, there's Coolidge with one of his dogs. And he's sort of smiling in that picture. That's about as close as he got in public. <coughs> Uh, we'll come back to that. There's his horse. He had the army make him a mechanical horse and set it outside the Oval Office. And if you were driving down the street in Washington, you might. This is like one of the, you know those things I used to have in front of stores where you, well, it was probably before you, you really, they had the little Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's kind of like that. And uh, Coolidge really loved his horse, his mechanical horse. He named it Thunderbolt. <laughs> and you might walk by the Oval or, you know, be out there driving by the White House and there's the president on Thunderbolt, uh, you know, going away there. Did he get a lot done as a president? Uh, well, you know, he had a reputation for getting a lot of bills. He signed a lot of bills into law. Yeah, he, he did. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was busy writing. when they say uh, hard work uh, never, never killed anybody, Coolidge's answer to that was, well, yeah, but there's no use taking any risk. So, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't... Uh, there he is. Uh, and there's his family. And uh, that was his uh, son, Cal Jr. And uh, he died while Coolidge was president. And Coolidge, never, he was out on the tennis court playing tennis. He's 16 years old. He's out on the tennis court playing tennis. And he rubbed the blister. You know, you all, we all you know, rubbed the blister on his foot. And what he did is he just popped it, you know, went on, and it got infected. And of course, today we have these wonderful drugs called antibiotics. And if you step on a rusty nail or whatever, you know, there's a punch full of antibiotics and you're well. But they didn't have that in those days. And uh, a busted blister could lead, and it killed him. He got a blood infection and he died. And Coolidge, Coolidge never forgave himself for that. You know, he had a, you know, he had a lot of faith in him. You know, I mean, I think Calvin Coolidge, you know, saw in this son, uh, you know, a future, a future. Not that he didn't love his other son, but he saw a future, future president there. So there's there's the Coolidge family before that uh, that uh, that hit. So uh, you know that's just a little uh, character sketch of, of Coolidge, and uh, that's why he's one of my favorite presidents. I'll just tell you a story. This may not be funny to you. One more Coolidge story, but he didn't like to go to church, and his wife never missed church. And one day she had one Sunday morning she had a cold, and so she said, "Cal, why don't you go to John? I don't want to go." And so finally she said, oh, please go. And so he got dressed and he went to church. And then he came back. He wasn't in a very good mood. And he walks in the kitchen, you know, the White House. And he just sits down and starts waiting for his breakfast to be served. And he was reading a newspaper. And she came in, stuffy nose. And all. She sat down across from him and she said, how was church today, Cal? Fine. And she said, what did the preacher preach about, Cal? And he said, Sin. That's why Cal Coolidge was just sin. And she said, well, Cal, what did he say about sin? And he lowers the paper and goes, so far as I can tell, he's against it. And went back to reading his newspaper. That's one of my favorite Coolidge stories. So far as I can tell, he's against it. Anyway, well, uh, Coolidge was a return to true conservatism.
Um, none of this, he, he, he's the end of, of progressivism. It's none of this uplift your fellow man. Uh, Coolidge's idea is you are responsible for yourself. Uh, look to no one for help except you. Look to no one for help except you. Uh, certainly don't look to the government for help. The government is not going to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and house the homeless. You know, what is this a return to? What idea? Rugged, Rugged individual. Exactly right. Rugged individualist. None of this uplift your fellow man, basically get a job, work hard, obey the law, and uplift yourself. He believed in a small government. Get this down. He is going to cut taxes. He believed that the government ought to leave business alone. What's that? That's right. Good. Laissez-faire. He believed that they ought, ought to leave them alone. His motto could have been hard work equals success. He said this. Get this down. This is one of his most famous quotes. You ever hear this quote? Anybody say it? It's Coolidge. He said, the business of America is business. In other words, America is about making money. The business of America is business. And he believed that every individual could rise to the top through honest hard work and thrift. Thrift is saving your money. Don't spend your money on everything that shines in the store window, Coolidge would say. So he did all that. He left things alone and get this down. The economy boomed like it never had before. It was the strongest economy America had ever had. And Coolidge had absolutely nothing to do with that. He had nothing to do with it, but he gets credit for it. And this is called Coolidge prosperity. That's what people talk about. He is one of the most popular presidents ever. You know, here's this conservative, sour-faced guy sitting up in the White House while the country's dancing to Charleston and, the, you know, the country's going absolutely wild and there's Coolidge sitting up in the White House and he's one of the most popular presidents ever. People just loved him. In fact, get this down, he ran for re-election in 1924 and his campaign slogan, let me see if I've got a picture of that. There he is. Yeah. Keep cool with Coolidge. Keep cool with Coolidge. And the American people said, we're going to keep cool with Coolidge. And they elected him by a landslide. Okay. You've never seen a landslide in your young lives yet. But, it, you know, I mean, it was just no doubt about it. So what was his greatest contribution? Get this down. His greatest contribution was is that he restored the faith of the American people in their government. You might disagree with Calvin Coolidge, his policies, and a lot of some people did. But Calvin Coolidge, you never questioned his character. He was faithful to his wife. He loved his family. He was honest. He never thought about taking a penny that wasn't his. A little different administration than Harding, maybe, huh? Yeah, you know, yeah. He wasn't running a backroom casino in the White House with truckloads of whiskey. Uh, you know, and uh, smoking, you know, uh, smoking cigars and, uh, you know, having his associates have a high old time. He went about, he went around, he was a serious man. He went about the business of government <coughs> and it worked. He got credit for something he had little uh, to do with. He, look, if there was ever a man who was in the right place at the right time, that's Coolidge's secret. Because here he's going to preside over this red-hot economy that just roars in the 1920s. And in 1929, he could have run again. And he was more popular. And we'll talk about that. But he was more popular than ever. 1928, he could have run again. He was more popular than ever. But he just said this, I do not choose to run for president. And that was it. Wouldn't you love to have a president that didn't talk for four hours every time there's a president? He just said, he said, I'm not running. And I'll tell you that story, too. They have to follow him all the way out to South Dakota, though, for, for, for him to tell them I'm not going to run. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he, uh, in 1928, he just, he just said, I'm not going to run. He was more popular than the economy. It was just exploding. And people were just saying, oh, please run. Please run. We love you, Cal. And he left in 28, 29. He leaves. Six months out after, wait a minute. Seven months after he leaves office, what happens? The greatest depression in human history hits. The whole American economy collapses. Talk about being at the right place. He just had this sense, this intuitive sense about him. He's gone. Misses, you know, misses the whole thing. Well, like I say, the economy boomed under Coolidge. There was full employment in this country. 
uh, and I want you to write this down because everybody has a job and they're making a pretty good salary. You have the, res the rise of the consumer culture. Okay, get this down. The rise, the, in other words, people, the consumer, you're a con we're cons all consumers, the consumer culture, the rise of the consumer culture. You know, the old idea was this. If you couldn't afford something, you just saved your money until you could. You had to save 30 years to get a house. You saved 30 years, but you never would go to buy a house and go in debt to do it. You went in debt on a few things. You might have a little tab down at the general store, but that was about it. During the 20s, get this down, you have the rise, you know, the, the idea of credit buying. It becomes a, and I'm not saying there had never been credit in the history, but I'm just saying credit buying. Because the idea was if you buy on credit, you're helping the economy. <coughs> Don't pay cash. If you buy on credit, you're helping the economy. The more you buy, the greater the demand. The greater the demand, more factories, more jobs for more people and more prosperity. In the 1920s, people just believed that their life was going to get better and better and better. So in the 1920s, the American economy ran red hot. Again, there was a boom. This is the roaring 20s, the roaring 20s. But in 1929, that roaring economy overheats, and there's the bust in the Great Depression. And all these people who had bought cars and houses and farms and businesses on credit, what happened to them in 1930? They lost it. Yeah, you're not living in your house anymore. You're out under a bridge with your family. I bet you, you know, I don't know this for a fact, but I'll bet you, I'm sure McIntosh County wasn't much different than most of the country. Uh, you could drive <clears throat> around the roads of, of back roads of McIntosh County and almost every bridge you would pass, there would be a couple of families and that's where they lived. Summer, winter, and fall and spring. That's where they lived under a bridge. Um, well, so anyway, but the depression was still in the future. Get this down though. The heroes of the 1920s were not athletes. They weren't movie stars. It's just, just to show you how, in, in, uh, you know, how deep we are into this economic prosperity of the 20s, but they were businessmen, okay? Business, are there businessmen sort of heroes today? Are there any businessmen that are sort of heroes today? Elon Musk? Is that yeah. Talking? If he was given, <coughs> don't answer this, but <coughs> if, if Elon Musk was over the auditorium talking right now, you had the chance to come and hear me expound on Calvin Coolidge, would you be here? Would you be with Elon Musk? can't believe it. I'm stunned. I'm heart scalded, as the Irish say. Anyway, yeah, they're here, they're, you know, Bill Gates. People go look at Bill, you know, or Elon Musk or Warren Buffett. Or so, you know, they go look at these guys because, you know, they're just made billions and billions of dollars. I mean, one of the reasons Donald Trump was elected president is that he was a very, uh, they believed, successful businessman. You know, there's just something, you know, this guy made billions of dollars or maybe he made a billion dollars. So, you know, he ought to, you know, he ought to be a genius at running the game. If you're a genius in business, you ought to be a genius in running the game. That's not true. But anyway, that was one of the, one of the things, not that's the sole reason, but that, that was one of the appeals uh, that he had. Well, in the twenties, it was the same. And of course, who was the businessman? Who was the businessman, not businessman? Who was the businessman that uh, in the twenties was admired above all others? Who? What? Ford. Henry Ford. Write that down. There he is. The son of Irish immigrants. Henry Ford. Who was a great American success story. Like I say, he was the son of Irish immigrants. His parents had fled the potato famine. Well, yeah, his parents, I think, had fled the potato famine. He didn't invent the automobile. You know that, right? What did he invent? Yeah, but what was so special about the Model T? Uh, parts. Yes, and what? You could buy one. You couldn't buy. You know, what if the only car produced was the Bugatti? How many of us would be walking to school? Everybody. Man, y'all would be broke. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was, you know, they had the Stutz Bearcat, man. You know, you could buy one, but uh, if you'd sell your, you know, three kids in the slavery, you could. But, but you you know, people. Like a win -win, yeah, yeah, well, people, people. 
people couldn't. Uh, yeah, but who are you going to get the ball to the yard? But anyway, that's another topic. Anyway, you couldn't uh, afford it. But Henry Ford put the American working class in the seat uh, of an automobile. Uh, and that's, that's, his, that's his place in history. Uh, the first Ford, and I've talked about this, but I'll just tell you quickly, the first Ford on the street, hit the street in 1896. It was that, you remember that? Maybe I've got a picture. Right, well, that's not it. There's a Maxwell. You ever worried about getting hit by a Maxwell? No, but they were so expensive, nobody could afford a Maxwell. They were handmade. And there's a model. There's a, that's a Model T right there, okay? Uh, anyway, I'm going to show you a little film clip here of a Ford automobile plant uh, at work in the 1920s. But, look, uh, the horseless carriage that he put was just a carriage. Uh, and it had a one-cylinder engine. It had, you know, we talked, I showed you that, didn't I? Solid rubber tires, no reverse. You didn't have a steering wheel. You had a tiller. That's the first thing he put on the road. But in 1903, he opened Ford Motor Company. He was so successful with those horseless carriages. Uh, it's him calling now. Watch this. Hello? Well, I told you not to call me again. Yeah, I did. Anybody want to talk to Jason from Energy Advocates? Oh, uh, you missed it. I'll have him call you. Okay. Anyway. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> Jason aside, in 1908, he produced the most fa his most famous automobile. That's when he put the T, the first T on the road. And by the way, this wasn't it. That's a later T. But he put the first T on the road in 1908. And it became the most, I think it's one of the most famous uh, automobiles. Uh, and then I, here are the great automobiles in American history. Take a look at this. You don't have to write this down, but just look. Here are the great automobiles. The Model T, 57 Chevy, 57 Chevy. We had one of those. Great car. And uh, the 65 Mustang. Not these Mustangs they have today. They're junk. But the uh, 65 Mustang. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a 1968 Dodge Roadrunner. Those are the great cars. You know, there are no more great cars. No, there, there are yeah, absolutely no, no, no. You've missed them all. You know, for the you know, the, all the all the great cars have, have been invented, and they're all gone. Once in a while, you see. I was coming here uh, a couple of weeks ago up this road construction, and about fifteen Model Ts, and boy, they were completely restored. They really looked good, right in a row, and they were going somewhere, probably to Model T convention. They came right down the road. But no, there won't be any more great cars. So you just forget it for the rest of your life. You're, it's true. I hate the depression, but you're just going to drive a secondhand piece of junk. Well, like a GC Ford? Oh, uh, forget it. No, no. What? Now, now, you might argue the GTO, the 1969 GTO. But no, you, you all were born too late. Yeah, yeah. You all were born too late. Sorry. I mean, the GT40 is old. Uh-huh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> the Model T, yeah, well, it's, it's a piece of junk. Anyway, the Model T, you know, uh, no, 50 years from now, nobody will be talking about that. They'll be talking about Model T's, 65 uh, Mustangs, 57 Chevrolets, and 69, I said a 68, 69 uh, Dodge Roadrunners. That's it. It's over, and there's no more to say about it, and I'm going to go on. Anyway, the Model T was called the Tin Lizzie or the Fliver because you had to put it. I'll show you guys. You had to put a, a, a little crank in it and pop it, and then the whole thing just sort of sh shivered for a minute until it started running. Uh, and it became known as the automobile of the working class. The very first one that Ford made cost $825. $825. America loved it. It was simple in construction. It was easy to fix. And by the way, that was a pretty expensive car because a lot of people were making about four or five hundred a year. So eight hundred twenty-five dollars. Simple construction is easy to fix. You can fix it with bubble gum, hairpins, baling wire. Farmers could take the engine out of it. There were four bolts that held the engine in. Just take the uh, just take the um, what am I saying here? The uh, God Almighty. <laughs> take the engine. Um, no, not the engine. The transmission. 
there were just two bolts that connected that, take that off, and then you unscrew four bolts, and you could just you and your somebody could just lift it out of the car and set it over there and hook your crosscut saw to it, and it would saw wood for you. Or you could hook it to your well, and it would irrigate your fields. And then when you oh had, my God. yes, and you irrigate, <laughs> then you could just put it back in, put those two bolts in, screw four bolts in, put that in there, pop it, and you can go to town. Okay, so it just had multiple multiple uses. Uh, and so uh, get this down. The saw with first year Henry Ford. First year Henry Ford sold ten thousand, and by 1921 he sold one million. And by 1924 there was a Model T Ford rolling off a Ford production assembly line every ten seconds, and they could not keep up with the demand. And by the way, since he sold so many, what happened to the price? By 1925, that eight hundred twenty-five dollar Model T that you had bought. Uh, with that, how much? Two hundred eighty-seven. Uh, well, you're pretty close. It's two hundred sixty-five bucks. You could buy two hundred sixty-five bucks. Here's Ford's secret. Get this down. We're not done, so don't pack up. Here's Ford's secret: mass production. He took instead of handcrafting these things, he took lessons from the Industrial Revolution. The assembly. He, listen, here's the, here's it in a nutshell. He applied the assembly line to the automobile industry, and he was the first one to do it. He was the first one to do it. And like I say, by 1925, one Ford car was rolling off. One Model T was rolling off an assembly line every 10 seconds. And by the way, in the same year, 1925, get this down, Henry Ford became the hero of the working class because he announced, I'll pay you $5 a day to work in my factory. That was an unheard of wage. People quit their jobs all over the world and came to Detroit to work in his factories. But the conditions were pretty brutal anyway. In fact, it was so tough. And he demand, And when I show you this film clip, I want you to watch how these people are working. They're not people sitting around, you know, like this when you walk in. I, I think about Lowe's. Better turn this off. No, I think about you go in there and they have, may I help you? And you, you go to ask them a question and they're on their phone. They're, well, just a minute. And they walk away and leave you standing there. You ought to, uh, well, that's one of the things I want you to notice tomorrow. After this test, I'll show you this little film clip of a Ford factory. How fast those people are working. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And it was such a strain to work in a Ford Motor Company that Henry Ford actually had to hire a thousand men to keep 100 on the job. Okay. A thousand men to keep because they would just quit. They'd, they'd work a couple of days and say, I know it's a huge wage, $5 a day, but we just can't take it anymore. And they'd quit and go back to the farm. So, anyway, uh, that won't be on your test tomorrow, probably, but look at all over.